So let's talk IVIG. Okay, so in this video, we're gonna get into five facts about IVIG, and we're gonna talk about some of the really awesome history surrounding its discovery and how it's used and some of the most common questions and topics that I get as an infusion nurse. And make sure you watch until the end because I include a bonus fact that everyone is asking me about in today's day and age. In the middle of a pandemic. Okay. Fact one, human immunoglobulin has been used since 1952 to treat people with immunoglobulin deficiency. Dr. Brutton first infused a child with undetectable gamma globulin levels who was getting recurrent pneumococcal infections. And later in 1981, the use of IBIG or intravenous gamma globulin or intravenous gamma globulins, mouthful man, was first documented as used for autoimmune diseases such as lupus, multiple sclerosis, Guillain-Barre syndrome, chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, CIDP for short, psoriasis, and dermatomyositis. We should have a specialty pharmacy spelling bee. Anyway, there are actually five different types of IBIG. So the one that we're most used to hearing is IgG or intravenous gamma. There are actually IgA, IgM, IgE, IgD as well. And they all do different things in the immune system. But for the most part in IVIG that we infused, IgG is the dominant class. Three, IVIG is a blood product and it is prepared from about a thousand to fifteen hundred donors per batch and it's the treatment of choice for people with antibody deficiencies. It's actually a miracle. So really interesting to make a year's supply of IVIG for one patient. It takes approximately 250 liters of whole blood. So now you can see why blood donation is just so important. And to make one liter of plasma, four donations of whole blood are needed. And to make an average yearly dose for patients that need this, it takes 250 liters of blood plasma to get this for a yearly, a yearly dose. It's astounding. And when donating blood, it's not just going in and, and donating whole blood all the time. You can actually donate whole blood, which is the whole kitchen sink and everything. You can also donate AB plasma. You can donate power reds and platelets. And I'll link the American Red Cross donation site in the description below. Go donate blood. Please go donate blood if you can. It is so needed. Fact four, IVIG is highly screened to remove any and all viruses. So the elephant in the room here and another common question that I get is if this is a blood product, how can I be sure that I'm not going to catch a really dangerous virus like HIV or hepatitis C from receiving this IVIG? And the short answer to that question is IVIG goes through a rigorous process of donor selection, careful screening of the donated units, and something called fractionation, which I can't even explain to you. IVIG and the, it, from the second it's collected till the end where it's infusing into your vein, there is so much work involved in this and so much science. And we have come such an incredibly long way where this is concerned and it is, it is life-saving. It is a life-saving therapy that makes a huge difference for all of its recipients. So personally, I'd like to thank anyone who has donated blood recently or in the past. You're my hero. Fact five, 
Allergic reactions occur in fewer than 5% of patients who receive IVIG and may be relieved by reducing the infusion rate or stopping the infusion for a period of time. This is obviously going to extend the duration that you're sitting in the infusion chair, which you might not be too happy about. But in the event you're having a reaction, those are two of the first things that your nurse will try doing, slowing the rate, and if she feels that it's merited, stopping the infusion. And IVIG reactions are particularly likely in people who have never received IVIG before, and this is the first jump into that, that pool, uh, or somebody who's had a recent bacterial infection because their immune system is ready to ready to go. And we talked about some of the common side effects in the last video that we talked about IVIG and what it is. So if you haven't watched that yet, definitely go check that out. And also your doctor will order pre-medications. The most common ones are Tylenol, Benadryl, and sometimes Solumedrol, which is a steroid given IV. And the nurse will administer all of these prior to the start of your infusion. So now my bonus fact or question, I should say. Does IVIG help prevent COVID? And the short answer to this question is, if the blood was donated prior to our pandemic, most likely not. This is still being heavily studied. However, in subsequent blood donations made after the start of the pandemic, the likelihood that that people who did have COVID and donated blood is a little bit higher, but based on what we've seen previously, we are expecting to see antibodies to the COVID virus in subsequent donations that have been made since the start of the pandemic. So when a new virus emerges, antibodies only actually become detectable after a certain number of blood donors have contracted the virus and recovered from it. So it's kind of a, a wave that comes after the initial outbreak. And that's why IVIG and the donations that are made during that period kind of need to catch up as far as showing antibodies to whatever virus that may be at the time. So I hope you found these facts interesting. I certainly did, especially the history of IVIG because I mean, who thought, who, how did they discover it? I'm, I have no idea, but I'm really glad they did. And I'll see you in the next video where we're actually getting into the specifics of subcutaneous IVIG.